right, we're going to get started shortly. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for EMCA's The Life, Times and Works of Dan Georgiakis. My name is Lou Katzos, the president of EMCA, the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. And I will be uh, today's uh, panel moderator. Our distinguished panel includes historian, author, author Professor Alexander Kitroff of Haverford College, author, historian, activist, uh, uh, Herb Boyd, Professor of Black Studies Program at the City College of New York, CUNY, scholar, author, specialist in comparative urban politics and social change, Dr. Marvin Serkin, author, poet, oh, uh, Nicholas Alexiu, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Hellenic American Project at King's College, historian, educator, author, Konstantin Hadzidimitriou, and Yorgos Anagnostou, the Miltiades Marinakis Professor of Modern Greek Language and Culture at Ohio State University. Dan Georgiakis' passing on November 23rd, uh, 2021, was a tremendous loss to the Hellenic as well as the greater American community. At EMCA, we were honored to have him on various panels including the one we had uh, on the Hellenic Revolution, its effects on the American abolitionist movement and beyond uh, panel discussion last year. And we valued and respected his insights uh, on the subject matter. Although it is impossible to fully describe his accomplishments in so many fields as an author, editor, historian, journalist, college professor, film festival organizer, and many other things. Our panelists who knew him on a personal level and in different ways will discuss this great man from their perspectives. Dan Georgiakis, uh, who was born in 1938 and uh, as we said, passed recently in 2021, was an American anarchist, poet and historian who, in, uh, who specialized in oral history and the American labor movement. He was best known uh, for some of his publications relating to Detroit in particular. Uh, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, a Study of Urban Revolution, which documents the African-American radical groups in Detroit during the 1960s and 1970s. In 1966, he and painter Ben Moriah with others helped found the Black Mask uh, Anarchist Group known to most of us as Up Against the Wall, <coughs> MF, affiliated with New York City's Lower East Side. In the late 1980s, Dan uh, uh, began co-writing the Encyclopedia of the uh, American Left. And Dan has long served on the uh, editorial board of Senest uh, Magazine and specialized in Latin American cinema. He was the director of the Greek American Studies uh, Project at uh, the Center for Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies at Queens College, the editor of the Journal of Contemporary Hellenic Issues, and was a bi-weekly columnist uh, for the uh, National Herald. His most recent book was My Detroit, Growing Up Greek and American in Motor City. It was a loving but critical memoir of Detroit in the 1950s and 1960s, when it had the highest standard of any American metropolis. My Detroit proceeds from the industrial east side to explore Detroit's complex racial, artistic, economic, and political life. It's uh, a subjective uh, companion uh, to his uh, Detroit, I do uh, mind dying, a historical account of the, of the city's uh, turbulent 1960s. He was the author, editor, and co-author of many titles, over a dozen. He has spoken about film and mass media on MTV, the History Channel, the Canadian Broadcasting System, Pacifica Radio, The Voice of America, and uh, Greek National Television, among other radio and television outlets. Dan has taught at uh, New York University, Columbia University, the University of Oklahoma, 
uh, UMass, Amherst, and Queens College. Many of his books have been written and translated into French, Italian, Spanish, uh, and Greek, or have been uh, published in the UK. He was also the subject of a documentary film entitled Dan Georgiakis, a, a Diaspora Radical uh, Rebel, I should say, by filmmaker Costas Vacas. The film screened uh, at the 17th Thessaloniki Documentary Festival in 2015. In it, Dan tells his uh, life story and his experiences, again, growing up in Detroit. He will be missed by many in the academic community, the hundreds of students who were honored to attend his classes and lectures, and our Hellenic and American community worldwide. Of note, uh, this is the 100th anniversary, of course, of the burning of Smyrna. And his mother and aunt were among the children who were rescued by the Japanese ship, the Toki Maru, uh, something he discovered actually uh, decades later uh, during the burning of Smyrna in, uh, in 1922. As a matter of fact, some of the discussions that I had with Dan when I was talking to him, uh, my discussions included uh, talking to him about figuring out how we can um, Re, uh, republish uh, what uh, was the journal of the Hellenic diaspora. And uh, in those discussions, I also you know, mentioned to him about the Tokimaru and my, uh, my discussions with uh, both Professor Manako Murata in, uh, in Tokyo, but also uh, Stavros Stavridis on the Tokimaru and the burning of Smyrna and the rescuing of about over 800 uh, Greeks and uh, Armenians during the burning of Smyrna. And he, he mentioned to me that his, his mother and aunt would talk about being rescued by the Japanese. And uh, he said when he first was listening to this as a, as a young boy, it didn't sink in until, until much later. With that, I'd like to start uh, uh, with, our, with our panelists today. Uh, you know, it's a, a magnificent group of panelists, like I said, who who have different experiences with Dan. And I'd like to start with, um, with uh, Professor uh, Nikos Alexiou. Uh, Professor Alexiou, uh, who is also an EMCA director, was born in Volos, Greece, where he studied economics. He has received an MA uh, from the sociology department at Queens College and also his PhD from the Graduate Center at uh, CUNY. He has taught in the Department of Sociology at Queens College uh, since, the 19, since 1990. And, his, and he has received the President's Award for excellent in, Excellence in Teaching. His fields of interest uh, are social and political sociology, ethnic studies, and research. He has established the first archive library museum for the Greeks of New York, and he is the director of research of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College. He's also a contemporary poet, and he is the author of six books of poetry, and, and, and many of his poems have been published in, uh, in Greek and American journals and anthologies. He is a member of the uh, Greek Authors Association in, in, uh, in Greece and the Greek American Writers Guild Association uh, here in New York. He also uh, has acquired, he has many years, obviously, uh, you know, uh, experience and dialogue with Dan, who he knew well, and he has acquired, uh, after his passing, some of his archives. Uh, welcome, Nico, and, uh, and please tell us about, about Dan and your experiences with him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clu, for all the introductions. I thank you for bringing together such a distinguished panel, as you said. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see again uh, Herb, to see after many years, uh, of course, uh, uh, Marvin, uh, Constantine, and... and, and, and uh, uh, I'm very pleased to see uh, George, George Anagnosti with us today. I'm very happy for this. And um, Dan is a common denominator. Uh, all of us, uh, we have some um, uh, interactions with him, some friendships, and this is a good thing that we all share uh, um, his uh, friendships, uh, uh, friendship and collaboration. Um, Constantine, I don't know if you're ready for, for, for going over some of the aspects uh, of this uh, multi-layer person, intellectual, activist, author. Uh, let's go, Constantine, move. As I said, uh, there are so many areas and uh, we need a, a whole uh, you know, week to have uh, a symposium uh, to touch 
of the various areas, a historian, a labor historian in, in, in the movement, the oral historian, you said, an activist, a poet, um, uh, the columnist, of course, uh, cinema was a great part of his, of his uh, activities. And uh, in, the next, in the next slide, Constantine, you see some of the things that you mentioned, uh, Lou, some of the uh, publications. And one of the books I would like to mention here uh, that um, I found it very intriguing uh, how come and he wrote a book like this about uh, living a longer, uh, longer age, the, the Methuselah uh, uh, mystery. A very interesting book. All right for for living longer and um, it, to me it was always uh, you know very intriguing uh, the many areas and interests uh, uh, he he had uh, and of course in all the things that you mentioned it's good to mention that he, he has at least three interviews with us and in one of them uh, is um, also uh, Herb involved in you when we talked last year uh, uh, a year before uh, about the black metropolis and we had this chance to discuss part of his book. Uh, I, met, I met Dan uh, when uh, uh, I first came to the States and, and, and started uh, my, my, my master's degree at Queen's College in the mid and late 80s. He was there teaching the various courses, uh, film, uh, labor movement, etc. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Kosadine. Uh, 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 and about the archives that uh, he he donated to the Hellenic American uh, overall of trying to do as archives to identify the, the items uh, uh, to collect as much as possible to arrange them and of course to preserve them including digitization and uh, I have more than 500 uh, uh, items so far and probably will get more that uh, Barbara is very kind to mention that uh, there is uh, some more uh, uh, of, of, of his paper that he she would like to uh, continue donating to, to have. Uh, so this is what we do. Um, and what we have so far, uh, besides the published uh, articles he has, he has a lot of book reviews, uh, periodicals that he donated, uh, and of course, uh, uh, letters from various uh, uh, people, his, his personal and uh, uh, academic uh, uh, correspondence that he had, some photographs uh, and cultural artifacts, uh, pamphlets, etc. Uh, in, in the next, in the, in the next uh, um, slide, I will see one of the, in the early days uh, when we met, he, he, he was engaged in a public dialogue uh, with, uh, um, with Charles Moscos, another um, Greek American sociologist uh, who had just published a book uh, in 1980 uh, about Greek American struggle and success. And um, Dan, uh, he presented uh, uh, a piece, uh, critique, not critiquing, but saying that, well, uh, is one thing to have uh, the dominant narrative about uh, the, 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 the struggle and success of, of a white ethnic group, but we have to take out the consideration also how uh, the aspect of whiteness of this ethnic group uh, contributed uh, to their success. And of course, uh, the debate continued. In the next, in the next uh, slide, we'll see the collaboration between uh, Dan and Moscow, because Dan was very generous. He was never antagonistic with anyone he, he critiqued, but uh, on the other hand, uh, on the contrary, he, he, he wanted to make um, more sense about um, issues concerning the Greek American community. So um, in a collaboration they had, it was a conference uh, in 1989, and then that came out as a book, all published by Pella. Uh, uh, it's good to, to remember uh, uh, and, uh, and thank uh, uh, Leandro Pella for doing all this for the Greek American community. Unfortunately, um, uh, the, the publishing house doesn't exist anymore, but we have all these beautiful publications by Pella Publishing. Uh, so uh, again, they, are, uh, they presented a, a general vision and analysis on various issues uh, regarding the Greek American community. Uh, the next item, uh, we'll see uh, his uh, workings on, on the working class uh, and, and, and the contribution of, uh, of Greeks 
uh, in America to the American uh, labor movement, which is very significant. But uh, as Dan argued, it was totally unknown or somehow marginalized. And uh, she started talking about, uh, she started publishing about uh, the Greek American um, uh, radicals. Um, of course, other people here today uh, will be more specific about that, about the movement. Uh, in the next slide, we'll touch about uh, his uh, travels uh, all over America and he, some pictures he took. This is uh, the, 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 the Tikas uh, grave, the Louis Tikas grave. And uh, he, he mentions that uh, his grave in, is next to the Japanese uh, Americans uh, in, in Colorado. And from what I know also uh, that uh, uh, if, uh, with your permission, Yorgo, I know that you're going to visit uh, the place uh, soon. Uh, you can tell us about that later. Um, in the next slide, uh, it is uh, the other love of his life, which was cinema uh, and cinas. Probably cinas is one of the two major publications regarding film and movies, and um, uh, in many, uh, in many, many uh, uh, issues, he, he contributes with his own uh, 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 critiques and, and reviews uh, and, and presenting also uh, Greeks or Greek American. Uh, uh, filmmakers and, and actors, but also uh, American films. Uh, he also um, uh, had uh, the opportunity because he was so well known, he was invited every year for many, many years to the um, very prestigious film festival in Thessaloniki. And so in, in a way he, he, he uh, served as a bridge between Greece uh, and, and the United States um, and the Greek Americans here. He was involved in the creation and continuation of the film festival here in New York. So he was a person who can uh, mediate both sides of the Atlantic regarding uh, Greeks. <laughs> in uh, one item that um, we found uh, in his archives, in the next slide, it is uh, a letter, an exchange he had with Elie Kazan, where Elie Kazan thanks him about um, a review uh, he made in the in the cineast, uh, so that, that that was, you know, the the level of communication he he had the ability uh, to to talk uh, with so many uh, well known people within the, the not only the American the, the Greek American community but also in the American uh, community. Uh, in the next slide is another uh, letter by a very famous uh, uh, filmmaker Gilles Dassin. Again, uh, it is handwritten, so you see uh, the immediacy and the familiarity they had uh, among them. Again, exchange and ideas and uh, a very pleasant uh, uh, letter by Gilles Dessin. But he knew, of course, uh, for years before uh, when Gilles Dessin was involved in making a movie here uh, in New York during the hundred years. Uh, Dan was also uh, very active against the, uh, the junta in part of the uh, anti huta movement in North America and uh, in New York in particular. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we'll we go to another facet of his life that not only he, uh, he knew all Greek American uh, literature, but he had uh, great uh, friendship and, and, and direct connections with uh, very prominent and well-known uh, uh, Greek American writers. One of them is a uh, long term friend, uh, Harry Mark Petrakis, um, and it's a very pleasant exchange here, um, talking about books, ideas, um, uh, visiting, you know, all these things. Uh, so, an another writer that uh, he, he had correspondence with in the, in the next slide, uh, Costa will see. Um, the, the uh, Helen Papa Nicolas exchange uh, they had again uh, pleasant, friendly, uh, and intellectual. Another aspect of his life in the next slide uh, that uh, uh, we all of us who were uh, started doing research and having some interest uh, for the Greek American community because this is another issue. 
uh, uh, since the Greek Americans constitute a very small uh, 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 group numerically, uh, is not uh, the main interest of many academics, either historians, sociologists, or anthropologists, or, or other scientists. But um, Dan's work and Dan and, and meeting with Dan that gives that gave us at least uh, to me uh, uh, raised the, the level of interest. Uh, to uh, uh, as, a, as a sociologist to, to research the Greek American uh, community. And of course, we can have a debate later. Uh, both uh, Yorgos, um, Alexander, and others know the problems that uh, Greek American studies uh, uh, um, you know, suffer from. And um, we thought it was a, a good time to have uh, uh, a panel in a symposium by the MGSA, the Modern Greek Studies Association, uh, uh, dedicated to Dan. Uh, here, it was here in New York, and it was a good chance for all of us to, to, to think about the Greek American community and how to research it and, and how to uh, um, reveal uh, the unknown stories uh, or critiquing the dominant uh, narrative of, of, uh, of success. Uh, and um, if you permit uh, more personal touches in the next in the next slide uh, when he wrote uh, this uh, this uh, beautiful beautiful memoir which is not exactly a memoir but the history of the city and the history of the working class of uh, Detroit and beyond she trusted me uh, with um, reviewing the book and, and um, my book review uh, from what I see, uh, uh, in the various uh, platforms has a lot of, of, of views and, and many people, not because of my review, but definitely an indication uh, to, to go and, and see the book. The book came up um, recently uh, with a second uh, edition and that shows how powerful that, uh, that uh, book uh, was. And I'm very pleased that we collaborated uh, on, on the book review. Uh, in, in the next slide, another collaboration uh, we had uh, with Dan uh, since he, he was him, uh, who it was he who introduced me to the Greek Jews here in New York, and um, uh, I thank him very much. Uh, in in in, um, in the mid '90s, when I started interviewing uh, the Romagnote Jews, uh, and uh, uh, Dan gave me also some of um, uh, the songs and music. And then we decided a few years later to have a whole issue of the, of the general of modern Hellenism dedicated to the Greek Jews. Uh, and also he invited me to be part of the uh, um, editorial uh, uh, team. And I thank him very much because that, um, uh, that gave us the opportunity to, to show that it, it, uh, we should uh, include we should include the, the Greek Jews immigration experience to the general Greek uh, 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 immigration movement because they came uh, at the same time as the Christians came and for the same reasons uh, in the early 1900s, unlike the Sephardic that came after the Second World War. So uh, for the first time, uh, uh, we, we uh, included, we situated uh, uh, the marginalized group of, of Romagnote within the larger Greek American immigration experience. And, and I'm very grateful for, for, for that. Uh, also, uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, some personal memories. Uh, one of the left, the black and white uh, picture, it is from the uh, 2011 uh, um, symposium of MGSA at NYU, where Everyone was very happy, you, you, you can see. Uh, Dan was a, uh, a people's person. He was friendly and, and loved by everybody, even journalists, <laughs> and then you can see that. Uh, and the next picture uh, next to it, it is um, um, on their house uh, uh, where Dan and, and, and Barbara were there and uh, they hosted me. And when we went through uh, his archives and his, uh, uh, bookshelves, and it was a very pleasant uh, meeting, and, and I have very warm and sweet memories uh, from Dan and, and Barbara uh, from them, for that period. Uh, and uh, in the next slide, 
is uh, to talk about dissemination. What do we do with all this treasure, all those things that, uh, that um, Dan uh, uh, you know, gave us and, and he keeps giving us? Uh, first of all, uh, it's useless to have gold and buried, right? It has to be, it has to be out and in circulation. So this is uh, what I mean about dissemination, that the knowledge uh, have to share. Uh, all, all this knowledge and disseminate it. So, and this is one of the goals that we have um, um, in, in the Hellenic American project. Uh, uh, first of all, we need to finish the digitization process of, of, of his archive and make it um, even more available and accessible to, to students. So far, uh, we have um, almost one third of the items digitized. Uh, We'll continue uh, next semester when the college is uh, fully open and have full access and of course some uh, some grants will, they will help uh, of course uh, already uh, dance interviews are available at, at uh, the Hellenic American project on our website uh, either uh, as an oral history uh, on the second generation uh, and some others on the special features under uh, poets, uh, and this is where people can find it. This is uh, from uh, early 2000 when the book was out, and we interview him in, in Astoria. And the next one uh, is from his reading in uh, in 2020. And later we had this one with Herb and Lou when we discuss uh, about my Detroit and uh, Black Metropolis. In conclusion, Costa. Uh, I think uh, we need to continue to create knowledge based on 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 on, on Dan's uh, inheritance, um, and 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 we support uh, as hub as institution personally uh, as a sociology this process, uh, and we want not only to secure but 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 uh, uh, to continue uh, expand on his uh, thought. Uh, so one of the things I'm thinking in the next slide, uh, and this is uh, an older attempt we had um, in, 20, in 2014, which uh, was in the, in the early stages of the Hellenic American project, we had established um, RSS scholarships, uh, uh, scholarship of his name, and um, he was uh, in the in the committee to evaluate students' uh, papers of uh, students or scholars who work on dance uh, archive uh, uh, or books get a small stipend. So I think uh, now is the time for a second attempt. Uh, the next slide HAP announces or proposes uh, that uh, we should, uh, uh, you know, reestablish. Uh, uh, the Dan Yorgakas research, uh, um, um, you know, uh, award or scholarship to continue uh, on that direction. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that other people will uh, go deeper to some of the uh, multidimensional uh, uh, issues that uh, you know I, I just touched here in order to develop uh, today's panel. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Nico. Uh when, when Dan passed, one of the, the first people actually that I communicated with, and I'm not sure if I called him or he called me, but, and that was uh, Herb Boyd. Professor Herb Boyd is an award-winning author and journalist who has published a number of books and countless articles for national magazines and newspapers. His recent book is uh, Black Detroit, A People's History of Self-Determination which has received several awards, including a final, uh, being a finalist for the uh, an NAACP Image Award. Among his other books are The, um, the Diary of Malcolm X, which he uh, co-edited with uh, Malcolm's daughter. Uh, Malcolm X Not uh, Reinvented. And uh, uh, Brother Men, The Odyssey of Black Men in America, an anthology co-edited with uh, Robert Allen, of the Black uh, Scholar Journal, which won the American Book Award for Nonfiction. He has been inducted into three halls of fame, including the National Association of Black Journalists and the International Literary Hall of Fame for Writers of African Descent. 
Uh, he is a graduate of Wayne University and he teaches African-American history and culture at the City College of New York in Harlem, where he lives. Uh, welcome Herb and thank you for joining this, uh, this panel. Uh, thank you, Louis. This is our third opportunity to uh, be with you. And I think you make me an honorary Greek. I mean, I <laughs> well, sir, you are, you are honorary everything in my, in my heart. Right <laughs> and I was looking at the uh, list of participants and I think other than uh, Marvin, I think everybody else is Greek here. Is that right, Louis? No, no, no. The, the, everybody's Greek here. Okay. Greek. Herb, Herb, you are, you are okay. absolutely Greek. Okay, thank you. That thank you. Marvin, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's so good, obviously, uh, to be back with Nicholas again, and and now having Marvin aboard, my goodness, and, and of course with Marvin, it's almost inseparable to think about uh, Dan without Marvin, uh, particularly the work they did on Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, which for me is a classic in terms of American labor and radical literature, ra radical uh, organizations, African-American aspirations. I mean, they captured the uh, zeitgeist. That's not Greek though, is it? <laughs> of, of a period of time of struggle in Detroit that is just absolutely remarkable. And I've used it in my classroom on many occasions since its publication. I guess it goes all the way back to the mid seventies. I met Dan just to, cut short here. Um, I'm not exactly sure what year it was. I think it was something like the late 50s, early 60s. And it was within the context of culture and theater and magazines. I stumbled up on a magazine in which he either was an editor or founder, of, and I haven't seen it mentioned in any of the, um, the biographical discussions of him. Um, even when I read through, uh, I think it's a photo in, 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 in um, his memoir. There's a photo of the magazine there of a friend we had in common. And that really connected, bonded us in such a way that uh, Wayne State University and the struggle in Detroit, and he was just indispensable and inseparable from all of that. I miss him in the sense that we were working on um, a couple of projects together. In fact, it would be the first time I really collaborated with him. And I kind of re I kind of reflected on his time with Marvin and the work they did together. He got in touch with me almost a year ago now, uh, 2021, somewhere like October, 2021, he got in touch with me and wanted me to work with him in an updating of the um, Encyclopedia of the American Left. And he had uh, a couple of extensive excerpts there, essays in there in which he discussed African-American history and culture. And I don't think he was feeling Lewis very comfortable about that. And I guess it's one of the reasons I guess he sought me to come and join him in that enterprise. And I certainly welcomed that opportunity. I mean, the Encyclopedia of the American Left uh, in fact, I think my first involvement there may have been under his uh, suggestion and recommendation. In fact, Dan was doing that quite a bit over the years to me, recommending me here, suggesting I be a part of this, that, the other. Uh, certainly with Cineas Magazine, I wouldn't be there without, without his recommendation and encouragement and editorial guidance. To say nothing of the encyclopedia, which I had at least three or four entries there. So to join him in the updating and working with Paul and Mary Jo Buell, that was like, uh, I mean, a godsend for me. And, and now to lose him in the process, because I think the publication is something like 90, 95. I think the last email I got from Dan was saying that the updating of the uh, encyclopedia had reached about 100, nearly 100%. So I guess we anticipate in, in the coming months that we will see again an iteration of Dan's enormous editorial skills, the versatility. It's just, it's the all-consuming passion that he had for struggle and liberation. I know when we, the last time we were together, and even the first time we were together talking about 
the whole revolution, the Greek revolution, everything, you got an indication of, of his prowess, the kind of insight that he could bring to a subject. I didn't realize that he was also a fantastic poet. And I learned that out of two, three or four poet, uh, poet friends of mine, who choice said, no, no, check him out, man. You know, he, he's got a way with words. I say, I know that from a political perspective, I didn't realize that he also had that to say nothing of film. Um, in fact, when Black Detroit came out, I was concerned about a couple of things in there and, and Dan raised a point with me. He says, look here, you got a citation of Elia Kazan and you call him a Jew. He said, no, 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 man. <laughs> so, so he corrected me on that. I was going on merely the man's name. I, I didn't realize it was uh, maybe a shortened version of something else, but no, he, he explained to me that it was an honest mistake and I tried to make that correction in future editions. Uh, that was the kind of the all seeing eye that he had. I mean, seemingly everywhere when it came to understanding the liberatory aspects of a people, no matter what. So I miss him in that context. I miss him as a companion, as, as a co-writer, as an editor, as a scholar, as a revolutionary. I miss him as a Detroiter who was, had a firm grip on Detroit's history. I mean, in, in, no matter what aspect you look at, he had some, he had, he had some a, an intuition he felt about Detroit on the labor qu question in particular. You know, working in those factories and the manufacturing aspect of Detroit, looking at the labor movement. I always wanted him to, um, and he brought me into, uh, when he was doing the second, I think Marvin was the second edition of Detroit, I, I, I Do My Dying, in which he invited me to come aboard. And, and uh, this Manning Marable was involved in that and three or four other writers, Ed, uh, Edna Watson, John Watson's uh, former companion. We all uh, offered essays updating to some extent, Detroit, I Do My Dying. Not that I really seriously needed that, I mean, it stands on its own as a, as a testament of the time and energy and insight that Marvin and uh, Dan and me, and you have the revolutionaries across the world who swear by that. I mean, even with the finally got the news, the uh, film that came out on the, uh, the, uh, the black workers there, the extenuation of the uh, Dodge Revolutionary Union movement. And of course, Marvin and, and Dan did a remarkable jo job uh, uh, surveying and then summarizing and offering some understanding of what the labor movement and and the black struggle in Detroit was all about. And I picked up on a lot of that when I put together uh, my book on, on on black Detroit. It had, and in many ways, you talk about radicals around the world. I run into them all the time and they always ask me about Detroit. I do my nine. I say, well, look, you get to dad. He's available. He will give you some insights on that, even beyond what he and Marvin had done there. And they say, well, there will be an update on that. I say, well, in a sense, it has been updated by the influence that they had on other writers and particularly me in terms of like picking up the mantle and carrying that torch forward. Because for me, Dan was an inspiration. For me, he stands as a, a beacon, a sentinel for understanding where we have come as a revolutionary movement, where we are, and certainly proposing where we should be headed. Because in a great way, Dan was a visionary, a remarkable human being and I used to talk about people being a credit to their race. Well, he was a credit to the human race. That's where he stands with me. That's where he always stand. And I'll always want and welcome opportunities to talk about his life and legacy. We can't do that enough. Let's do it again, Lewis. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and thank you, Herb, for that. Uh, he, he was obviously an amazing individual when it came to connecting uh, people together. 
And yes. I and I think I think a lot of that came out when we did uh, obviously the panel discussion on the Hellenic Revolution of uh, mm -hmm. 1821 and the American abolitionist movement, which maybe oh, right, right, many people right. didn't, didn't comprehend before we started to speak about it. All of us, uh, how in fact you know the revolution actually affected the abolitionist movement here in the United States, and certainly in terms of the the rhetorical arguments that we used. Uh, you know, to free the, the uh, black slaves in, in, in the U.S. And I, and I thank you very much also for the other discussion that we had, obviously, which had to do with uh, Johnny Otis, which uh, yeah, many, right. people, many people thought he was black because he, he felt black. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, that was but, a good uh, one. You know, many people didn't realize he was, he was also Greek, not only Ilya Kazan that we spoke about earlier. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining, oh, joining us. Oh, thank you for again. inviting me, Lewis. It, it, was, it was great. Thank you so much. So Our educational next, uh, to be with you. Mm -hmm. same, same on my end. I, 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 I <laughs> got to be honest. And I, and I thank very much, obviously, for the uh, Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce that connected us together uh, to begin with. I, I think that was you know, absolutely fantastic. Our mm -hmm. next presenter is, uh, is Dr. Marvin uh, Serkin. He is a mm -hmm. scholar, author, and specialist in comparative urban politics and social change. He received his PhD in political science from New York University. And again, he conducts uh, and has conducted workshops on uh, workplace and community organizing, urban political economy, and urban renewal in the U.S. and its significance uh, for the development in the third world and comparative urban architecture. He lectures frequently on urban issues. His book, uh, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, a study in urban revolution, examines the activities, perspectives, and changing formations in the cadre of black revolutionaries that worked in the core of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in the early 1970s. The book served as an inspiration for the 1999 film, Finally Got the News, Revolutionary Black Unions in Detroit. He was the co-author with, uh, with Dan uh, on his uh, Detroit book. He and Dan have been associated with uh, that project and many other projects since uh, 1969, uh, uh, with many additions, translations, discussions, lectures, and uh, related activities. Marvin has been a professor of political science and urban uh, and labor studies since the mid uh, 1960s at many universities, including uh, the uh, City University of New York, Adelphi University, Long Island University, uh, University of, Bar of uh, Barcelona in Spain, Autonomous University of Morelos in uh, Mexico and others. He is currently retired, and we are so fortunate to have him with us today. Thank you, Marvin, for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Louis. I'm glad we uh, were able to connect with this uh, with this event today. And please do let me know if you uh, as you proceed along the ways. Uh, anything related to Dan, I'm certainly happy to know about and participate in any way possible. Well, not not only Dan, but other subjects. We will certainly connect with you. Marvin, sure. thank you for being with us. I, I want to say one of the ways you introduced it, or you, you, you titled this panel was also dealing with the times of Dan Georgiakis. That's, that's correct, yes. I want to say a little something, start with a little something about that to take a slightly different tone and, and then I'll get into some of the more specifics. Uh, Dan and I were both born in 1938 and we both have working class, uh, immigrant working class roots. Both of my parents were born in the United States, uh, background Jew is, is, is Jewish. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia and Dan's from Detroit. And, uh, and uh, my father made it up to third grade and went out to sell newspapers when he was eight years old. So I had that kind of background. And we, had, we were able to share those kinds of experiences back and forth, uh, which was so interesting. And when we used to go to Detroit quite regularly and doing this, doing the project of for Detroit, I do my dying. And I'll tell you a little bit of background in, in a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> we would often stay with the, with a, a Syrian friend of Dan's who became a friend of mine, a guy named Ernie Nasser. And so it was the Greek, the, the, the Syrian and the Jew, and we would stay together and we were just the best of friends doing all kinds of funny things. Uh, <clears throat> What I, what I think the kind of things I think of Dan is that uh, I think of him the kind of the words I think to mention who, who he was as a person and as a character in this world is 
Dan was honorable. He was loyal. He was radical, as, as I think has already been definitely very much mentioned. He was committed and he was an intellectual who believed in action, who believed in getting things accomplished, who believed, who believed in people. He loved everything, I think, Greek. Uh, he didn't love everything Turkish, but he definitely loved everything Greek. He, he loved America. And he deeply believed in radical change and the people's potential of really making change. And he saw that in film, he saw that in poetry. He, you know, some of his poetry was about uh, Native Americans. And, and I think if people are not aware of his poetry, it's very, very useful to go back and take a look at the poetry, especially the kind of things he wrote very on, early on in his career. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that's like, it's a helpful and kind of a background to set the times. The other thing I'd like to say about his times is uh, Dan and I were both born in 1938, as I mentioned, right at the beginning of World War II uh, and made it through a lot of our work that we did as coming of age in the 60s and 70s and into the, into the latter part of the 20th century was in fact a period of time in American history and some ways in a lot of Western history, but certainly in American history, of the greatest success of upward mobility uh, that, we, that we have known in history. And so it was sunsets, and I think the Detroit book, Detroit I Do Mind Dying, reflects that, reflects the great successes of the African-American working class, of the Appalachians who came to Detroit to also work in the factories, of the Palestinians who uh, came, came to Detroit and, and worked in the factories. And the book Detroit, I think of in some ways as perhaps one of the earliest ex uh, examples in American sociology or in American cultural and political history of really acknowledging the role of African Americans. Uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me just repeat that. Of Arab Americans uh, existence from an early period in this country, particularly that's true in Detroit where there is this very significant population in and around Detroit and definitely in and around the, the auto industry uh, and, in, and, the, and in the unions as well, of an Arab American uh, population. <clears throat> so we have a whole section on that with poetry in the book that deals with that as well. <clears throat> uh, it's also another way of focusing this period of history that I've lived through and Dan has lived through and I think maybe a number of us have lived through this period as well. And that is, it is the great success of the American working class. If you think of 1937 in Detroit, and you think of 1967 in Detroit, right? And you think of, of the, the, the top and the bottom of what happened. One of the things when I've talked about this book and we gave, we, Dan and I gave talks and lectures and interviews and uh, for over, over such a long period of time, uh, let's say from the late 60s into like the, the mo even the most recent period, uh, we, one of the things I like to say is that Detroit in many ways represented in the first half of the 20th century, represented everything that was good, everything that was positive, everything that was progressive about America in many ways. Uh, up and coming of the, of the working class, the automobile itself, uh, the creation of, of suburbs and shopping malls that existed in, that existed in and around Detroit, and and then I say the second half of the of the twentieth century represents everything that is kind of you know downturning and negative in many ways about what happens in America: race strike or struggle, uh, uh, urban urban revolutions or urban riots or urban urban revolts that were, that were going on in Detroit, and in fact the beginning as the successes of the uh, organized labor classes, particularly in, in the auto industry, and particularly in Detroit, were reaching their height. They were beginning to decline and there were these give backs and take backs. And, and the late 60s in Detroit, which is also reflected in this, in this book about Detroit, is basically a characterization and a historical documentation of exactly those successes and exactly those, the beginning of those declines that occur exactly at the same time. And many things I think that are happening today, if we, if we use uh, the historical example of what happened in the auto industry and what happened with the United Auto Workers and what happened with organized labor and what happened with race relations, 
that as using Detroit as a kind of an example of that, we will understand a lot more about what's actually going on today. And then hopefully from that, figure out how we're going to proceed into, into the future. And that was our greatest mission that Dan and I, we, when we bonded together to create this, uh, this book, which is actually now, it's been in print since 1975 and still in print. And I recently got a royalty check uh, from um, uh, the, tra the French translation and the, and the British uh, version of it and the American third edition of it so that it's still in print. It's still being used by guys like my buddy Herb Boyd in his, in his classes and so on, which is remarkable. And it's remarkable because it's really, it really tells a, a very, very vital and, and essential story about American society and American life. Uh, <clears throat> just as another little aside, one of, the, one of the things that happened when we, our first publication was with a commercial publisher and after that, we were with kind of leftist type of publishing like the Haymarket Press is the current publisher. Uh, and we walked in one day somewhere along the, the line where we were already submitting a number of chapters and we were in the editing process. And our editor at the, at the publication says to us, well, I think we're gonna to have to cut out this chapter you have here, which I think deals with culture. And and we said, oh, hey, wait a second, wait, wait a minute. I said, that's what the whole book is about. <laughs> you can't just take that chapter out. And then we explained to them that really what we were getting at, because it seemed like they really didn't understand the book that they were they had a contract to publish and ultimately did publish, uh, what this book was really about. Because the way we interpreted it as we learned from the Detroit activists and organizers themselves, we learn that politics is culture and culture is politics. So we have the politics of culture and the culture of politics blended in such a way that this book is really a story of poetry. It's told in poetry, it's told in song. So we have an Arab American poet and we have a working class, you know, white a factory working poet on the, on the back cover of the book. And even when we came to identify the title of this book, we called it Detroit colon, I do mind dying, a study in urban revolution. Well, what was that all about? And the publishers said, that's not a title for a book. How are we going to sell this thing? And, and then ultimately, and of course, it has become iconic as a way of really describing something which transcends a particular historical moment or a particular political moment because it has control, uh, cultural longevity. It really does resonate because the title came from a, from a blues song by a factory worker, African-American, right? Uh, who after hours was singing in the, in the bars and he was singing blues that he wrote. And the song was, please, Mr. Foreman, slow down the assembly line. No, I don't mind working, but I do mind dying. And this song is played in a voiceover version in the film, which was partially made by the same Detroit political organizations themselves called Finally Got the News, which is still around and still very worthwhile to take to your classes and show to people, or, or at least to have part of a document uh, of experience, visual experience of what happens in Detroit. So we were involved in filmmaking as the activists in Detroit were as well. Uh, <clears throat> another thing to tell you about is uh, just a little bit about how Dan and I when I started the idea of working on this book back in somewhere around 1968, 69, I was a, you know, a college professor out in Long Island, uh, Nassau County, Delphi University. And I came up with the idea of writing a book about uh, working class and successes of the working class and uh, efforts at the working class to, to begin to transform institutions in the society. And one of those uh, essays was going to be about Detroit. And I didn't know people in Detroit and I had never actually never physically been to Detroit at that time. And, 
So I said, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to go to Detroit myself and try to do the research. I went to West Virginia myself and did research on the United Mine Workers and Miners for Democracy, which was a movement, a radical movement within the union at that time. Uh, and I needed, I wanted to team up with somebody who would work with me on this, on this essay about uh, Detroit, the Detroit experience, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which was the leading, a leading organization, which is which is a focus on focus of the book. And I can't remember exactly how it happened. I was in New York City and in Long Island and uh, somebody put me on to this guy named Dan Georgiakis. And it turned out he was living in North Jersey at that time. And uh, I, we met and we teamed up and we went out to Detroit and it was in the most amazing experience. We spent about 10 days out there and we, we, we spent from, place to place, meeting the people who were the radical organizers, the, the union people, the activists, uh, who were uh, in and around the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Dan knew all these people. Dan had met them, met them. he had gone to high school with them in Detroit. Uh, he, as, as described in his, in his autobiography about my Detroit, he talks about what it is to grow up Greek in Detroit. Right. That's sort of like sort of it's easy for people to say what it is to grow up black in America, what it is to grow up Jew, Jewish in America or when the Jews became white is another way people sometimes talk about it when people began to become integrated. And he talked about what it was to grow up in Greek in Detroit and the kind of discrimination that he experienced in school, along with his, you know, African-American friends and, and who else with other people as well, Syrians and, and other other immigrant people from immigrant groups. And we came back from that experience, having met firsthand organizers there. And we, on the drive back to New York, we, start, we were discussing continuously this project. And it turned out, we said to ourselves, you know, this is not just a chapter in a book. I said, why don't we just do a whole book about this? So I had this idea to begin with. I teamed up with Dan. We went back to New York. We proceeded to get a very, very small grant from a small, um, uh, foundation, and we got a we got a, a contract with a small advance from the publishing company, and so we kept going back and forth from New York and New Jersey to Detroit to do this project. And over the course of about a year and a half or, or so, we submitted the book. We we got them convinced that they had to keep the, the the chapter on culture. We had them convinced that they had to keep the title. We even had them convinced that on the back cover of the book, if you look at the original version of the book that was published by St. Martin's Press, you'll see that it, rather than put the author's uh, you know, credentials on the back cover or quotes from famous people on the back cover of the book, we put a poem <laughs> on the back cover of the book. And we had a wall art on the front cover of the book from the, you know, uh, experience of Detroit very, very close to where Malcolm X had, had preached at the church. And, and it was a wall that had been used as a place for uh, uh, wrestling. And we talk, even talked about how baseball and wrestling were such an important part of the immigrant experience in a place like Detroit, which is also included in the book, to show how much we really got into the cultural dynamics of the whole thing, not just the politics. Anyway, that book was then published, and that was 1975. And I'm, I'm very happy to say I'm trying. I was trying just now, as we were as we were preparing for this, to think of the name of the publication. But there's some uh, kind of leftist uh, newspaper, regular newspaper, published out in California uh, some years ago, put together the hundred best books of the 20th century. And I'm happy to say one of the books that was in that list of the 100 best books of the 20th century was Detroit, I Do My Die. So Herb, I hope you'll keep, continue to use it in your classes at, the, at City College as well. Uh, <clears throat> and, and as I mentioned, it has three editions uh, in English. It was, has a British edition. It has a relatively new a French edition. Uh, and that was very interesting too, because Dan was not in, in, in healthy status enough to go on a, on a book speaking tour to France and Belgium when the French edition was published by Agone, A-G-O-N-E Press in, uh, in Marseille. 
uh, a few years back. But I, I was fortunate enough to go on that trip and I went to, gave talks um, all over France and in uh, several places in Belgium. And one of the things that was so interesting about that is people that came up and wanted to talk to me about the book after the talk or show me copies of the book and have me autograph it. They, several of them came up with the first edition of the book which goes back to 1975. And now we're somewhere around 2012 or 2015. And they're showing me the very first edition of the book. And then of course I experienced there, but the experience that I've had many times, and I think it was mentioned earlier by, by Nick or perhaps Herb, but I've met so many people in the course of this past 50 years dealing with issues related to Detroit and dealing with issues related to uh, radical organizing, political organizing, union organizing, and pe so many people refer to this particular book as the book that turned them on to be getting involved in, in, in social action in an organizational work. And, and that, of course, is very, very, very revealing. And Dan was a very major part of that. Dan and I worked together uh, for this book. Um, and continued to believe that this was something that we we had to uh, see uh, and successful and experience through as much as by as many people, particularly young people and young students, anywhere where we went. And I don't want to say more than that right now. I think there's other people want to speak, but I just want to say I'm very happy to be here and to honor this to honor myself with Dan. I will, I will say one more story. <clears throat> Dan was living in Massachusetts for. A number of years after we had a major heart attack and his him and barbara were able together so something like 10 or 13 years to keep him going and to survive after a very 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 major heart attack and at the very end of course his brain was working terrifically but you know his body was obviously failing at this point and for the last few months of his life I had the opportunity because I was also living in Massachusetts for the last couple of years. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm back in New York. And once a week I was going over to Dan's place. I taught him how to play backgammon. And we would sit and talk about politics and play a game or two of backgammon and have a little bit of lunch. And I was there about two days before he actually went to the final stages of uh, of this, his, his round, his life. So we remained close over the course of about 50 years or so. And of course, it's for me, it's been a very major part of, of my, you know, contribution, not only to, you know, American society, but a contribution to hopefully uh, the uh, increasing activity and hopefully successes that we'll have in the future with the younger generation. And do, boy, do we need we, we did it ever much more today than ever than ever. So thanks again for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. No, no, Marvin, uh, thank you for joining us. And we're honored that you're here with us and sharing those, uh, those personal moments and uh, some of the background and history that many people really don't, don't know about, about the book that was written uh, with you and Dan uh, writing it together. Uh, the next uh, panelist that I'd like to introduce is uh, Konstantin Hadzi Dimitriou. Uh, Dr. Dimitriou, uh, Hadzi Dimitriou was born in New York City and holds a PhD from Columbia University in Byzantine, Ottoman, and Balkan history. Uh, he's been with us before, obviously, on some of our past discussions. Uh, you know, he's a great scholar, and among his numerous awards and cit citations include uh, Hellenic Educator of the Year, uh, two Queens uh, Borough President Citations for Excellence in Community Education, an NEH fellowship. He has been recognized by uh, President Clinton for his contributions to scholarship on the history of Hellenic American relations and the Distinguished Social Studies uh, Educator Award from the Greater Metropolitan Social Studies Association of New York. Dr. Hadzi Dimitriou is also the author of two books, American Accounts Documenting the Destruction of Smyrna and founded on freedom and virtue, documents illustrating the impact in the United States of the, war of, of the Greek War of Independence. 
In addition to many articles in scholarly journals in the fields of Byzantine and modern Hellenic history and education, he has taught at Columbia University, the New School of Social Research, Bank Street College, St. John's University, the University of Thessaloniki, and various uh, uh, City University of New York colleges. Welcome, uh, Constantine, and thank you for being here with us today to share your uh, experiences uh, with, with Dan, who we um, are honoring and commemorating today. Thank you, Lou. I'm honored uh, to be here. Um, I have to um, begin in the following way. When you contacted me uh, to participate in this panel, uh, one of the first things I did was I went into my archives and pulled out my Dan Georgiakis file. I have a Jan Georgiakis file, as I do about most of uh, the people I've interacted with uh, over time in uh, Greek studies. And I began reading um, letters uh, pre-internet. Uh, things tend to be uh, better preserved uh, than uh, they are now where, uh, you know, you send an email and uh, if you don't print it out, uh, it eventually disappears. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you that uh, I began uh, crying. Tears uh, came to my eyes because I realized, uh, I always knew it, but even brought it home, that uh, for decades, uh, Dan Georgiakis was uh, one of my, uh, or probably my greatest supporter behind the scenes uh, in, uh, in all aspects of, uh, of Greek studies. Uh, and uh, for me, he's a dear friend uh, who will be uh, with me forever and is irreplaceable. Um, I first met him uh, in uh, the 1970s. He was teaching a course in modern Greek language and culture at LaGuardia Community College. I was a graduate student and somebody told me about the course. And of course, I was always interested in anything Greek. So I went in and just sat in his class and Dan uh, didn't uh, mind. That's the way uh, he was characteristically. And so I listened to him um, and was, oh, immediately impressed by what he had to say. Uh, many years later, I inherited the same class, but um, uh, that's how our interaction began. And uh, then uh, in the uh, 80s, uh, when I returned from uh, my research days in Greece uh, and um, uh, living in Thessaloniki in Athens, I uh, picked up uh, uh, the relationship and we uh, uh, maintained it uh, for over many decades. Um, when I looked at my archive, the other uh, person who uh, was always uh, intensely involved in the um, discussions that we had on a wide variety of subjects, but especially on Greek American um, uh, culture and history, was uh, Steve Frangos, uh, who uh, is missing from this panel. Uh, Steve uh, and, um, and Dan had a long an intense relationship and always interacted uh, on, on um, uh, Greek American subjects. In fact, um, the three of us, uh, Dan, myself, and, uh, and Steve, were kind of outsiders. Uh, we um, uh, uh, were not on the inside of the standard uh, establishment. Uh, Dan was kind of our leader and um, we uh, corresponded and, and talked about how uh, Greek American studies were not really embraced uh, for a long period of time in the modern Greek Studies Association and in the, uh, the formal academic world uh, kind of in general. Uh, Dan uh, brought about change. Uh, he uh, uh, worked from the inside and really made Greek American studies uh, a uh, legitimate and uh, important part of uh, Greek studies in general. Uh, and this took place throughout the 80s into the 90s. Uh, and um, uh, today, I, I, I'm happy to see that you have George Anagnostu here. Um, Dan uh, created a uh, committee uh, eventually in the MGSA on Greek American studies. And um, uh, the evolution has been that now we have this very fine website and resource that, um, that, that the uh, 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 Anagnostu has uh, put together. Uh, and uh, it's really an integral part of Greek studies. And he even has a Frangos archive. 
So uh, Frangos has become mainline as well uh, and accepted. So um, Dan succeeded in, in getting Greek American studies included. And um, as time went by, uh, he uh, became so uh, accepted and uh, his leadership role was acknowledged to such an extent. And um, uh, Professor Alexiou mentioned it uh, in 2011, the MGSA even held a panel uh, about Dan and his work. Uh, I don't remember how exactly it came about, but I was honored to chair that panel. And I began the panel by saying that um, uh, Dan to me is a Renaissance man. There's so many fields that he's com contributed to that uh, it would take an entire conference, not just a panel, to properly um, even outline all of the work that uh, Dan Georgiakis uh, has done in so many fields, whether it's art, whether it's history, uh, whether it, even gerontology. Uh, I think of the book, uh, The Meth Methuselah Factor was mentioned. Uh, I read a review of that book and uh, people in that field um, reviewed it very positively and thought it was an important and excellent book. So you, you have a person who not only had an impact in his own field, but in many other fields, uh, labor history, of course, uh, the history of the, the, uh, of the left in general, et cetera. Above all, uh, I, I think um, the previous speakers have alluded to is uh, I always admired Dan's courage. Dan was a courageous individual. He spoke truth to power and he was always for the underdog. Uh, you could always go to him and Dan would support you. If he thought that your argument had merit, he would support that argument. If he uh, thought that he could help it by sharing his knowledge and his resources, he never said no to anyone, especially young people who were trying to make an academic career or uh, publish a article or a new book, etc. Dan was always there and he was open and he always shared. Uh, he wasn't the type of uh, uh, prominent academic who would keep things to himself. He would send you his books, he would send you uh, what you needed, etc. cetera. And uh, I always admired that about him and it was characteristic of the man. Uh, he is known as a prop, uh, appropriately as a radical uh, and uh, as a, a person who um, shook things up. But uh, there's another aspect to him that isn't often talked about. Dan was all, uh, also a, uh, a fervent Hellene. He cared about Greek national issues in a very uh, emphatic and profound way. And I experienced that in several respects. And I, I'm just gonna outline them um, in, in brief. One was uh, he and I shared a common background. Both his mother and my mother were Anatolians. They were born in Asia Minor uh, in uh, a suburb of Smyrna and uh, experienced the destruction of the city, the great fire, and uh, uh, they um, became refugees thereafter. So Dan was always interested and supported uh, mine and uh, any other writings about the Anatolian um, uh, catastrophe, about the treatment of minorities in Asia Minor by Turkey and about the uh, continued up until this day, denial of uh, what took place and uh, trying to set the historical uh, record straight. And um, he wrote uh, quite a bit about this and uh, always supported everybody else who wanted to write about that as well. Uh, he also took a stand on uh, the recent Macedonian issue in terms of uh, uh, academic freedom, uh, minority rights, uh, and uh, the Hellenic positions. And he understood the, um, the historiography related to uh, Macedonia and that whole issue. Uh, and um, I got embroiled in some controversy and he was one of the few insiders, I would say practically the only insider uh, in modern Greek studies who supported uh, the um, position I took on uh, 
uh, the Macedonian issue. And um, I very much appreciated his support. Um, even um, uh, in more recent times, uh, he, um, uh, he, he helped uh, and supported me uh, in many ways. Uh, and I remember uh, we uh, participated in a um, MGSA conference at Harvard. And uh, I gave a paper on Greek continuity uh, during the uh, Ottoman period. And uh, in fact, I gave two papers at that conference. The other one was on a Greek American subject. I believe I was the only one ever to give two papers at an MGSA conference, after which they passed the ruling that uh, this would not be allowed. I think Dan had something to do with uh, uh, enabling me to uh, 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 participate in two panels at a, at, at a, a conference. But he wrote a, um, a piece uh, in, um, uh, uh, in uh, um, the um, a Greek American uh, newspaper uh, about the uh, conference and about how um, the level of, um, how could I put it, um, hostility towards anyone who challenged the prevailing views on Greek national identity and continuity and discontinuity um, was, was given. Uh, again, it took courage uh, and it took um, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a clear eye and uh, very much uh, a uh, balanced approach because Dan was a, uh, a, a, the ultimate scholar. Uh, he always um, uh, uh, knew his sources. He cared about uh, historical evidence and he always dotted every I. And uh, I don't have to say this, everybody uh, knows this. He was a superb writer and editor. Um, he could uh, look through uh, and immediately spot inconsistencies or uh, um, um, poor thinking uh, in um, anything that was written. Uh, he, of course, uh, contributed uh, to the um, uh, Journal of the Hellenic Diaspora. Uh, I'm sure that Anagnostu and Kichwef, Kichwef, I remember uh, back in, uh, in the 80s when that issue came out uh, about um, Moscos and, uh, and, uh, um, and um, and uh, George and uh, Yorgakas, um, he had a rejoiner, uh, and uh, he was very much of an advocate for inclusion of the uh, uh, Greek left in Greek America, which had been ignored uh, for a very long period of time. And he played a major role on. Um, uh, and of course, he drew upon his deep knowledge of labor history and um, uh, the um, uh, American left. Uh, in uh, applied it to uh, the um, uh, uh, movements and the organizations and the publications of the uh, Greek American left and their uh, uh, struggles in, uh, in the union movement, the Furriers in particular and others. And we talked about that um, over the years uh, quite a bit. And uh, he made a significant difference as I'm sure uh, my colleagues in Greek American studies will uh, say more about and highlight, and I'm sure they know it better than, uh, than I do. Uh, so he contributed to the Journal of Hellenic Diaspora for a long time. And then he became uh, the uh, editor of the uh, American Hellenic Institute Journal of Contemporary uh, Hellenic Issues and uh, editor of the Journal of Modern Hellenism. Uh, two very important publications of impeccable uh, standards. Uh, and uh, the Ahi one in particular uh, always highlighted uh, issues related to uh, Greek uh, uh, national issues, uh, Cyprus, um, uh, all kinds of, um, and it was very open and, and continues to be very open in including young scholars and people with uh, points of view that might not always be aired. Uh, of course, the um, uh, Journal of, um, uh, of, of Modern Hellenism um, uh, was in collaboration and continues to be with Queens College. Uh, it had some other affiliations in the past and an international um, uh, uh, board of scholars and published uh, very important and uh, groundbreaking articles on a wide variety of, of subjects. And Dan did an impeccable job in editing both of those for many, many years, 
soliciting articles and um, never turning away individuals who, who the quality of what they uh, were talking about uh, was not of the highest level. Um, for reasons that I'm still not sure about, uh, because as I said, for the longest time, um, uh, we were outsiders, although um, uh, Dan became very much an insider in the field. I've been asked to uh, take over the editorship of both publications, and I am certain I cannot ever hope to match the uh, scholarship or the editorial uh, writing uh, or the um, uh, just wonderful work that uh, Dan did. Uh, all I can do is try in some way to keep things going and honor his memory. And um, I, I'm honored to have uh, that opportunity. Uh, two issues will be coming out. Uh, the first will be uh, the uh, Journal of Contemporary Hellenic Issues, uh, which uh, will be forthcoming first. We hope to get the Journal uh, of uh, Modern Hellenism out uh, over the summer. Uh, Dan collected um, and uh, left us uh, 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 lots of articles for uh, the Issues Journal, uh, less for uh, the uh, Journal of Modern Hellenism. Uh, I've been going through um, quite a few emails, over 100 emails uh, that were forwarded to me uh, by Barbara and um, uh, Van Kufadakis and Chris Ioannidis, um, who uh, uh, played a major role, as uh, everyone knows, uh, in the uh, Center for Byzantine and, and, and Modern Greek Studies at Queens College and the journal and um, worked closely with Dan uh, for many, many years. Uh, and um, the whole team at Queens College was closely associated with it. So um, I, I'm hoping that I can maintain uh, on, on some level uh, the standard uh, that, uh, that Dan uh, has pioneered. And I look forward to um, uh, and I encourage all of you uh, to continue to um, uh, send uh, both publications uh, uh, articles that you feel uh, merit publications and will contribute uh, to uh, modern Greek uh, studies. And uh, the uh, Journal of Modern Hellenism spans from the late Byzantine period uh, into the modern period as well. So it has quite a bit of a range. Uh, so it covers a, a uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, territory in terms of Greek studies, language and literature, anthropology, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm honored to be part of this uh, panel. I will always miss him. Uh, my son uh, it went to Queens College and uh, when he was a student there, I called Dan and I said, um, my boy is gonna be uh, a student at Queens. Will you look after him? And of course he did. Uh, because, like I said, uh, above everything else, he was a wonderful, wonderful human being. And I'm always going to miss him. Uh, I'll never meet anyone like him ever again, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine, for, uh, and it's our honor that you join us today to speak about this uh, unbelievable, multifaceted uh, individual. Uh, in terms of uh, your out, uh, outsider days, I think your outsider days are numbered. I think you're becoming, I think you're becoming an insider. Quite yeah, frankly. Me, me and Fragos have, uh, over time, when, you know, things, things have a way of changing, I guess, over time. Thank, thank you. Like Yaramata, as we say in Greek. <laughs> our next, uh, our next uh, panelist is someone we all know, uh, historian, author, um, uh, Professor uh, Alexander Kitroff of uh, Haverford College. His research and publishing focuses on nationalism and ethnicity in modern Greece and its diaspora and its manifestations across a broad, amazing spectrum from politics to sports. His numerous uh, publications include uh, The Greeks of, um, of Egypt, Griegos and America, Wrestling with the Ancients, Modern Greek Identity and the Olympics, Elas Evropi Panatheakos, Ekatochronia Eliniki Historia, The Greeks and the Making of Modern Egypt, The Greek Orthodox Church in America, uh, A Modern History. And among his current uh, book projects includes A History of Ahepa to appear in its uh, 
uh, appear this year, actually. It's 100 year anniversary in uh, 2022 and a history of uh, Greek Americans and diner uh, restaurants. He has continued his uh, cl uh, various collaborations with uh, various uh, uh, directors and has been a consultant on four documentaries uh, with various uh, current projects that are quite frankly, extremely uh, numerous. One of the things, one of the things that I always loved about uh, Alexander and Dan actually, had to do with their work in uh, what was discussed earlier in terms of the uh, journal, journal of the Hellenic Diaspora, uh, which I indicated early on that at one point I was trying to figure out uh, how we get it uh, republished uh, from Pella, et cetera. And I, I had both discussions actually a few years ago with uh, both uh, uh, Alexander and, and Dan. Alexander, thank you again for being with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, for this invitation. It's an honor to, to be in such good company and to, be, to have the opportunity to say a few words about Dan. Uh, I'll start with the um, Journal of, uh, I'll start with the Journal of Hellenic Diaspora. The Journal of Hellenic Diaspora was an anti-dictatorship publication that began in uh, the late 1960s uh, and uh, 1970s. And it was taken over by Leandros Papathanasiou, the small publisher uh, and printer in um, New York City. And Dan was one of the, the first four editors. It was an interesting mix. It was an interesting mix of people because you had activists and scholars. And Dan, and it was said, uh, I noted here, uh, an intellectual who was engaged in action. And uh, Dan was that. The Journal of Hellenic Diaspora was, was, was academic, but it was also activist. And it, that wasn't easy. It was, it was difficult to balance. Some people wanted it to become the Greek American I don't know, left, uh, uh, what they called new left review or something like that. But it, 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 it always balanced between the two. And I actually, I think, I believe I replaced Dan, technically I replaced Dan. There were a couple of people who left and we joined, but Dan never really left because the publisher had such huge respect for Dan that he, he used to call him up and consult even though he wasn't on the editorial board. Dan uh, taught me how to be, how, I never thought you could combine being an intellectual and being an activist. I thought those two, two things were separate because if you did one, you couldn't do the other and vice versa. Uh, and, and that's why I, I had this um, problem of dealing, figuring out where the journal was going. And Dan was very clear that you could combine those two, um, those two functions. I got to know Dan even better when after a while he rejoined the journal. I believe it was uh, in the early 2000s and we were the two journal uh, editors. And uh, we, uh, I was more academic because Constantine would call me an insider and Dan was more activist, and we had wonderful discussions. He want how do you get things published in a journal? We had pressure. You need you need to bring the the journal out. It's like having deadlines in a newspaper, even though it's quasi academic. And uh, uh, Alexand Dan Alexander, was... I, Alexander, I apologize. The image, your image, uh, disappeared for for a second. I'm not sure if there's an issue with the with the image. Uh, and oh, if there is, just continue. See? But but I, I just want you to know that there's an issue with the image being frozen. So uh, my apology oh. for interrupting. My apology. Um, can you see me now? Yeah, we can see you. It's just, uh, it, it, it must be the fact that you're in, uh, I guess you're in Athens right now, right? Or, or, or... Yeah, yeah. I got, okay. I, got a, I got a message that, I got a message that the internet connection was 
was okay. Uh, then, then you know what? Our apology. Just continue, and I apologize again. Uh, yeah, it's it's probably an okay. internet connection. Yeah, no, no, ahead. but yeah, let let me know, and then I repeat if it's something's left. No, over. no, we we can hear you. It's just your image which is okay. not coming out. Uh, you know, uh, appropriately, but okay. that that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, good distance. So. Um, Dan was, was able to, uh, as, as Constantine referred to, he was able to rescue stuff. We, we used to get articles, and I said, this is a great topic, but, but it's not good enough for the journal. And, and Dan's editorial skills came through in a very nice way because he was able to help people. He used to be able to, to get, get articles published that no, would not have gotten published without his editorial curatorship. And when I hear about him being in, in other journals, I'm kind of thinking uh, just the number of articles that Dan must have edited for other people whilst he had his own writing and stuff to do is really quite remarkable. The fact that he spent so much time sharing his time, helping, helping young scholars. And I think the Journal of Hellenic Diaspora that closed down and in 2013, lasted as long as it did only because of Dan's activism, his ability to solicit articles, and his ability to improve articles through, uh, through editorship. But what I want to, if, if the journal is one, way, one area that we interacted, the other area is the documentary of the, on the Greek American experience uh, the journey, the Greek dream in America that came out in 2007. And Constantine also participated. And I think Yorgos had to go to Greece at that time and, and, and hadn't, uh, wasn't able to appear in, in, in the documentary. There were two things that struck me with his presence in the documentary. He used to, um, he had this, pithy way of coming up with the most interesting, bold, and innovative statements about Greek America. I still remember three things. He spoke about the Greek sponge divers in Florida and the way that they employed Black Americans and how the Greeks and, um, and had a, some kind of alliance with the Black Americans paid them enough for them to work for them. And they clashed with the other, with the other, the, I guess it was the white or the, whatever it was, the American uh, uh, sponge diver fleets. So this kind of alliance between, between Greek sponge divers and blacks, that was one thing. The second thing again, and he just, he, he just said that. And if you kind of, you know, there was so much else to say, uh, about it. Uh, the second thing, the Greeks going into the textile industry in New England, the early wave of Greek immigrants, one of the destinations is the textile industry in New England. Dan stressed the fact that it was women who went into the textiles because it was, it was a particular job that they could do. And this was a quite kind of radical departure because a Greek America was very patriarchal and uh, the men went to work and the women stayed at home. But in the, in the textile industry, the women were dominant. And the third thing that comes out of his experience in Detroit, which is still, you know, I'm, I'm this, you know, these are three phrases that Dan says in the documentary that, that are kind of topics for further research. This third phrase, was that Greek towns were not really just Greek. When we talk about Greek towns in America, whether they're in New York in Chicago or Detroit, by the nature of the fact that these are immigrants who are lower class, socially workers, employees, the likelihood is that in those neighborhoods, they will be Greeks, but that they will be other ethnic groups of the same social status. And he spoke about the way that the Greeks interacted with other ethnic groups. And, and we mentioned already the connection with the Arab Americans in Detroit, the connection with the Jewish Americans as well. These were things, these were things that Dan 
uh, uh, mentioned as as types of information that for me I was coming into Greek American studies at the time were were totally new for them for me they were eye opening and and really helpful. A uh, third point I want to make is that debate he had about the Greek about the role of the left in Greek American studies with Charlie Moskos. Moskos was a, a sociologist, very well known for his work in uh, the sociology of the military. I think he is credited with the uh, don't ask, don't tell policy that the military uh, uh, um, adopted uh, during the Clinton administration. So Charlie was, was big in his field, but, but had this particular interest in Greek America. But, but, but he was, he had certain ideas. He had some ideas. He had the, the upward social mobility model was very clear in his mind, assimilation. The study of his book was struggle and success. And in the model of struggle and success, there was no place for the left because success had, had, had meant that everyone had gone into the middle class, which of course wasn't the case. And Dan was the person who interacted with Charlie Moskos and uh, helped us understand the history and the legacy of the left in Greek America. But what was remarkable about the exchange that they had was that it was a sharp exchange which was not polemical. There was never a, um, a kind of friction between them because th there was a conference that they participated. They were co-organizers of a conference and they were collaborating very, very closely, keeping their own views, et cetera. And that, that was for me also an eye opener because you know, in academe, you can have um, uh, narcissistic personal attacks. Uh, they are part of the um, landscape of academe. And, 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 and Dan wasn't, wasn't there. He had his strong opinions. He was coming up against a well-known scholar of Greek America and coming up with an opposite view, but it was all done in a kind of interactive way and they both had respect for themselves. And this field is so small, it can't afford to have people falling out with each other. So Dan's, um, the way that Dan handled the, his debate with Moscos over the left and the way that he advocated for the left was, was instructive. He was a, in all these things, I feel he was a, he was an indirect teacher and an indirect uh, mentor uh, who um, made me what, what I am, I, the, the way that I operate, I think was indirectly hugely influenced by the way that uh, uh, Dan uh, led the Journal of Hellenic Diaspora, the way his interaction with all the documentary, the preparations, the filming, um, what else we'd put in that was extremely instructive. I won't go into the, um, the, um, the last time uh, I, I saw Dan was when Yorgos uh, Anagnostu and I went up to Amherst, Massachusetts to uh, to interview uh, Dan, uh, we stayed there a, a couple of days, and uh, oh, it was it was such such a treat uh, because uh, Dan always shared his scholarship, but this was unique because you could sit into sit in his living room and go over everything. I was particularly interested in the uh, going over the journal, going over the documentary. But above all, the junta years, because Dan, eternal credit to Dan and very few other activists. There were so few Greek Americans who stood up against the Greek military dictatorship of 1967 to 1974, went out on the streets outside the United Nations uh, to, um, to demonstrate. Um, and in doing so, again, 
uh, I also thought that Dan had a very wonderful perspective because um, I think Yorgos will will confirm this, but he he talked him he talked about being a, something an anarchist, but not not a conventional leftist. He wasn't with the hardline communists. That wasn't Dan. Dan was too Dan was too multifaceted to fit into the particular little slots that the Greek left had fallen into at that time. And uh, that the, the junta years of, of Dan as well were, uh, uh, were, were a huge contribution because those few activists, I think, uh, uh, helped Greek America look much better than it, uh, than it would have done if we didn't have that uh, activist group against the colonels. So his activism against uh, during the dictatorship, his wonderful role in the Journal of Hellenic Diaspora, his multiple contributions in making that journal an alternative voice of Greek American studies, and his wonderful perspectives that he shared both in the documentary and in his debate with Moscos. These are longstanding legacies. Uh, they'll be sometime, sometime down, I don't know, in two, three decades, someone might even write a history of Greek American studies, who knows? And Dan is going to be at the center of that narrative. Thank you uh, for having me here to share my, my views, my memories of Dear Dan. Thank you. Alexander, thank you so much for being with us uh, today and, uh, and just sharing some of the other perspectives of, of Dan. One of the things that you mentioned, by the way, that Dan was involved in, one thing you mentioned uh, had to do with the uh, women's textile industry. And as, as, you were, uh, as you were talking, as you were talking, I was thinking of my mother. I was thinking of my mother, who was in the uh, in the textile industry with many other uh, Hellenic women during uh, during the period we're talking about, and how she used to work in the factories, and how uh, how she would bring in uh, uh, piecemeal work that that we <clears throat> would work in at home, including uh, including my sisters that we would work at home as, as a little kids, you know, doing things uh, you know that then they could um, you know make some money money from. So th thank you for bringing that up. It's something that I <laughs> that as I didn't think about it recently, to tell you the truth. And, and again, it, it shows how amazing Dan was uh, with all the different aspects of, uh, of American and Hellenic American uh, industries and, and, and different things that he was involved in. Our next uh, and final presenter before we open up the discussion a little bit is uh, author, uh, eth ethnographer, Yorgos Anagnostu. He is the Miltiades Marinakis Professor of Modern Greek Language and Culture and the Director of the Modern Greek Program at The Ohio State University. His research interests uh, includes uh, modern Greek studies and American ethnic studies with a focus on Greek America. His published research covers a broad range of subjects, including film, a documentary, ethnography, folklore, literature, history, sociology, and public humanities. His work has appeared in various publications, which includes uh, uh, Mellis, Diaspora, Ethnicities, uh, Italian American Review, Journal of American Folklore, uh, Journal of American Greek Studies, and we can go on. He is the author of uh, Contours of White Ethnicity, Popular Ethnography, and the Making of Usable Past in Greek America. As a matter of fact, I have the book right next to me because yeah, I'm sitting here in my own uh, little library. And uh, he's also, uh, he's also the, uh, has written two poetry collections. He is the co-author of the, of the volume uh, Comparisons, Encounters, Identities, Italian and Greek Americans in Conversation, uh, which is forthcoming from uh, Fordham University uh, uh, Press. Since the late 1990s, he has been serving uh, the Modern Greek Studies Association in various capacities, including the organizing and co-organizing of various uh, symposia. He has co-founded the uh, Greek American Studies uh, Resource Portal, uh, whose mission is to share with the public information about the scholarship and the arts in uh, Hellenic America. Since 2017, he is the editor of the online journal Ergon, 
uh, Greek American Arts and Letters, which features Hellenic American scholarship, poetry, and essays. He writes uh, regularly for the uh, Hellenic and Hellenic American media. Welcome, uh, welcome, uh, Yorgo, uh, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Lou, for the um, introduction and the invitation. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with the panelists and the uh, audience who is uh, uh, joining us uh, to share some thoughts uh, about Dan Georgiakas. I would like to honor Dan in the form of a posthumous letter I wrote him yesterday. So I will be reading a letter uh, to Dan. Dear Dan, it is now more than four months since the news of your passing. Despite your age, I was in disbelief when I found out. I supposed you would be with us forever. Once the news of your death sunk in, I made it my habit to, my habit to revisit your work, rereading your scholarship about Greek American studies mostly, a subject that was dear to you and a subject that we share the passion about, both of us. I also reread excerpts from your memoir, some poems, and listened to some of your interviews. I plan to study your seminal work Detroit, I do mind. As I reread your work, I try to take the measure of what you have left us, our inheritance. And I grapple with the question, what to do with this inheritance? What should each of us individually and all of us collectively do with what you have left us? What is our responsibility your work. As I reread your work, I realized more than ever how much the immigrant past mattered to you. You cared about the past. You wanted to direct our attention to it, particularly those aspects that have been neglected or forgotten, discarded as irrelevant, or tossed aside as uncomfortable. You wanted us to know about the working class, the exploitation that it suffered, its involvement in the labor movement for a better America. You wanted us to understand the power of racism. In an interview in 2018, you called it the cancer of American society. You wanted us to understand how it shaped our place and the place of others in the United States. You also wrote about women from a unique angle, unconventional, creative, bold, Greek-American women in the 1960s. Your poetry also spoke about the experience of young Greek immigrant widows who had no other options but marry much older men. You wanted us to understand the past, to grasp its complexities, to know its contradictions. You were a historian committed to documentation and determined to speak historical truths, even if those truths were taboo and made some in the community uncomfortable. It was, you felt, your responsibility, the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do. You had no patience with sugarcoating of the past. You witnessed it and you knew how unfair, one might say how violent it is to try to cut the past down to size, to feed idealizations and serve, and serve triumphalism. As a historian and a person who I witnessed immigrant life, you knew better than to simplify immigrant lives. You refused to caricature Greek Americans. You knew that immigrants struggled, worked hard, enjoyed some success, experienced failures. This is why you were impatient with the narrative of struggle and success. Life is not a linear highway leading to the El Dorado of the American dream. Your perspective, your words resonate with me deeply. I started my life as a working class immigrant who achieved some things, 
but failed in others. It is refreshing, viscerally refreshing, to hear you speak about the humanity of Greek Americans, to recognize their limits, their failings, which is to say, to recognize their humanity. In this, you are in good company with Helen Papanikolas and Harry Mark Petrakis, who also I witnessed much of 20th century Greek America and did the same. This passion of yours to humanize Greek Americans connects to another passion of yours to develop Greek American studies. You saw academic research as a venue to understand Greek America's complexity. You recognized it, the scholarship, as one of the few remaining venues along with literature, poetry and film to learn, to reflect, to speak about difficult topics and new ideas. This is the reason you never tired of advocating Greek American studies. You saw the value of high quality, committed, rigorous Greek American research. You were calling for its institutional growth for a long time. But this call remains unheeded. Our institutions have not taken the necessary initiatives, at least not yet. In our conversations, we often pondered this question. Why is it that Greek Americans who take such a great pride in their educational achievements do not invest in Greek American humanities and social sciences? Why are the names of our poets, novelists, and labor heroes unknown? Do we know who George Economo was and why his work matters? Do we know why Louis Stikas was murdered? Do we know about the work of Nikos Petropoulos and why it is important? Do we know what a Greek American author meant when she wrote of her family's heritage of fear? Do we know what Dan meant when he was referring to the ethnic third eye and its significance in living as a Greek American, as an American Greek in the United States. Dear Dan, I read the praises of your person in Greek American obituaries. There is exaltation about your contributions to secular Greek American Hellenism, praise for promoting Greek American studies. I wonder what your feelings and thoughts would have been had you read this overwhelming approval. Perhaps you would have cracked your wry, knowing signature smile. Perhaps you would have said nice words, but will action follow? You have left us with a legacy of many words and actions, Dan. The question we should be asking, I believe, is what we do with what you have left us. Do we know as a community what we have inherited from you? I'm thinking a great deal about your non-academic intellectual work, your work particularly as an editor of the American Journal of Contemporary Hellenic Issues, for example. Also, your numerous talks sponsored by Greek American organizations and communities. I'm trying to understand your major shift as I see it, from radical politics in the 1960s and 70s to a kind of mainstream cultural activism in Greek America in the post junta years. During our interview in 2019, when I last saw you in person, I got the feeling that you wanted to bring change by working from within as an insider. And you accomplished much. You managed to feature Greek American poetry in a Greek American policy journal. You kept inviting me to submit work for broad, non-academic voices. You published essays by Greek American college students. You wanted, it seems to me, to gradually open up Greek American institutions to the humanities and social sciences. But I wish you were here with us today to disclose, did you feel there were limits to one, what one could or, could or could not say in these settings? Was there something radical you felt the need to say, but for some reason 
you didn't. This question preoccupies me, and I believe it was on your mind too. Is there room in Greek America for an inclusive, open dialogue, which includes critical self-reflection? At some point in your life, you were struggling for a Greek American success, an alternative success, a success we rarely, if ever, talk about. Success in sustaining an exciting and yet agonist agonistic conversation about Greek American issues, the ways we represent as a community the Greek American past, the kind of cultural policies we practice, the Greek American future, the vision for a Greek American future. It seems that we need to, har to harvest our best democratic impulses to make this happen. Then it is time to bid farewell this is my second farewell. The first was my tribute to your work in the journal Ergon. Then you kept working, working until your very last days to enrich our understanding of Greek America. You spoke about taboo topics. You insisted that academics should also learn to speak for a broad Greek American audience. You advocated that we create spaces, journals, blogs, webinars, webinars, to foster an exciting American, Greek American conversation. This is the inheritance I embrace and feel the responsibility to keep alive. I do not believe the journey ahead will be easy. After all, we have been building these spaces of learning for some time now. We have, built, we have been building it, but will people come? What will it take pe for people to and organizations to support our projects. Dear Dan Georgiakos, son of Detroit, of New York City, of Anatolia and the Peloponnese, Dan of Cineast, of Detroit, I do mind dying, of Black Mask, of anti junta activism. We will not only remember you, we will keep you informed of our news. We don't know what the news will be. That depends on us. Thank you, Yorgo. And I'm, I'm not sure if we can, after listening to all this, I'm not sure if we can uh, say farewell to Dan. As, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm not sure if there were limits for Dan, quite frankly. So you brought up a lot of, all of you have brought up a lot of issues why we, we, should, we should not say farewell to Dan, uh, nor, nor ever forget Dan. And, and what an amazing, what an amazing, unique, multifaceted individual, uh, you know, we have been dealing with. It, it's just amazing. He, he not only uh, represents and has done a lot for the, uh, as we indicated, for the Hellenic American community, but for many communities. I mean, he is a, a unique American. He's in a unique American that it go, the goes and has went into a lot of different issues. What I'd like to do is just as, as a closing scenario is, uh, is uh, just go back to each one of you um, because we've listened to each other obviously speak and just, and just give some final comments, uh, questions, other things relating to Dan. I'll start with uh, Nico, if you can, uh, you know, some, uh, some final comments uh, you know, to what we've been discussing on someone, quite frankly, we cannot forget, and we, we should and will not forget. Yes, uh, of course, I'm very emotional. <laughs> and uh, uh, as I said uh, in my opening remarks, that uh, not only we need to, to document uh, what uh, Dan left as the inheritance, but uh, how we disseminate, how we build up. And I'm glad that, that, uh, that uh, theme came up so many times and uh, yeah um, regardless of his physical uh, uh, absence uh, I also believe that uh, he is with us he is as long uh, as they say as long we we keep reading the boys they, they're never dead so uh, this is this is the story with Dan that he, he is among us uh, and he, he will live as long as we 
continue to read him and expand his uh, thought and, and writings. Uh, I'm very, uh, um, you know, thankful for uh, today's uh, meeting. I think, uh, although we only touch some aspects of uh, his personality and, and dimensions, I'm very pleased we did that. Uh, and thank you all for that. Th thank you, thank you, um, Nico. Herb, uh, we've we've obviously talked a lot about his Hellenic American activities, but but we also know Dan as many other things. Some some um, closing comments, Herb. Is Herb I mean, with us? Yeah, oh, yeah. Just yeah. just it's amazing. It's like going to a workshop on someone of um, just enormous. This enormous affection that he had for so many things. I don't know how you gather that much passion, you know, for so many items. But he had that kind of um, certitude, kind of um, fulsome, you might say, a very fulsome individual. Had this this lustful life, you might say, and and also a quest. Well, it seemed like always on a mission. You know, there's some objective he was trying to achieve, and and he threw everything into it. I was just trying to find uh, Lewis, the last communique that I received for him, and he was going back over some of the uh, important Detroit. I mean, CLR James. You know, facing reality. Of course, Marvin would know a lot of these things. Marty Glaberman, uh, Grace Lee Box. Uh, he was reminiscing and exchanging uh, letters with Paul Buell, the co-editors of uh, the whole Encyclopedia of the American Left. And they were going, they let me be a part of that conversation that they were having. And it was just so interesting to see it had the same kind of impact on me as being a part of this panel. It's almost like being a fly on the wall, you know, an invader or something, somebody who's intruding and listening in on, on some very, very personal and private conversations. And that's what I felt like he wanted me to see this. He wanted to see this conversation that he was having and it is so rich in history, Detroit history in particular, but also the whole understanding he had of third world movements. And that's integrated in here. I mean, his understanding of, of James Boggs and Eric Williams and the whole Caribbean and Latin American, he had a grasp on all these things. But for me, it was centered. It was centered in Detroit. And it was out of that kind of working class, labor, activist, radical associations that shaped and formed him and put him in a position where he could inspire and certainly touch so many lives, the young people. I was listening to how the letter, I mean, George, that was a, a very moving letter and a testament again. and. And Nicholas and the Constantines aboard here to say nothing of Marvin. I thank you again, Lewis, for putting me in touch with them because, you know, Dan is a conduit. He continues to be the conduit. Well, Herb, you're not going anywhere because now that the conduit has been, has been established, we're not, we're <laughs> thank not, you. We're not going to let go of the of the conduit. That's for sure. <laughs> thank M you, Marvin. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Herb. Uh, Marvin, some some uh, thoughts um, on Dan. Not final thoughts because this is not final for us, but some uh, thoughts on on Dan. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm so I'm so amazed and so impressed and so pleased to be part of this group. This is this is an awesome group, and thanks to Dan for bringing us all together. Uh, it's one of the things that I think everyone who spoke today said there was always something that you could learn. There was always a new chapter. There was always a new wrinkle. There was always a way to edit and make it refined, to make it clearer, 
to get get them get it more from thought to action, and all that rep is represented by Dan. And this this discussion today definitely it, it mimics that. It copies it. It, it. it it kind of you know espouses that, and I think very successfully. Uh, just I want to add just a, a couple of points. <clears throat> I think. Uh, I can't remember who was it in the group today, but spoke about marginality. Uh, and I think Dan, in, in many ways, and I think I definitely resonate with that in my own personal experience too, very much is a marginal figure. He, he kind of enjoyed his marginality. Uh, very often with other friends, we used to say, look, Dan has managed to get all through life and never really have a full-time job. How do you manage to do that and yet be in so many fields and so successful and constantly working and constantly also making an income to live on? And so in some sense, I think he was both marginal and central, vital in such a way, especially in this post-World uh, War II last 80 or, 80 or so years of the Western world, and particularly of this, of this country in American society. So in a way to summarize that, Dan represented both the breadth and the depth of so much that is real, that is honest, and that is in, 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 the, in the very, very deepest way, radical, radical to the core to make things believable, thinkable, and realizable, achievable. And I think that's what that's that's the message that he's put out, and that was the message of his life. So thanks again. Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you, Marvin. The the uh, the yes, uh, presenter Marvin. who mentioned marginality was uh, Professor Professor Alexiu. Yeah. Uh, 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 Constant Constantine. And now that you're uh, an insider, now that you're an insider, Constantine, some some thoughts on uh, on them. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm. Uh, Thinking about um, uh, George's uh, Anagnostus uh, letter to Dan. And um, Dan issued a challenge for us. Uh, I may be mistaken, but I think his last publication may be the preface to uh, a volume on uh, Greek American education that recently appeared. He wrote the preface on Sumachis and uh, Zervos volume. And in that preface, what he does is he uh, it says that the challenge uh, for Greek Americans is to reconstitute uh, the meaning of Greek American identity for the 21st century and incorporate uh, the non-Greeks because of uh, intermarriage and the assimilation aspects uh, going forward. Uh, people have been uh, predicting the uh, disappearance of Greek Americans for uh, a very long time. And yet uh, Greek American identity and Greek American culture somehow uh, survives. Dan uh, uh, was ambivalent. We, we talked about this quite a bit. Uh, and um, uh, at sometimes he thought that a survival was uh, likely. Other times he thought that it was less likely. But in that uh, piece, uh, he issues that challenge uh, about making meaning. And uh, in um, uh, George Anagnostus' uh, letter as well, uh, he talks about why um, uh, Greek American culture and history and society is not embraced by the community at large. Well, I think what Dan would, would say uh, is we have to make it meaningful. We have to make it useful. We have to make it important. Uh, and that's the challenge that he leaves us, and he'll continue to talk to us uh, in the um, years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine. I, I think one of the things that uh, Dan brought out uh, more than more than most Hellenic Americans was the multicultural aspects of of America, and how these multicultural aspects within all of us makes us all culturally more aware of our own cultures. So, so he's a genius, I thought, with regards to that. And this was evident, by the way, when we talk about uh, when when uh, the panelists, of course, discuss not only 
you know, the Hellenic uh, American aspects of Dan, but also the Black America aspects of Dan and, you know, other cultures also. When, when, when we talked about all, all the different cultures that he was involved in simultaneously, he, he understood culture. He understood culture. So uh, if we can, Alexander, some, uh, some, some thoughts on some of what was discussed today. And again, uh, this is not a farewell to Dan. This is actually, uh, this is actually saying to us, uh, we've, we've got to jump into exactly what Dan was talking about and, and, uh, and pursue some of the things that he had discussed always. Alexander? Two points, two points, I've unmuted myself. Uh, the first is one, start with something I forgot to say. If I recall well, Dan stuck up for Elia Kazan when uh, Kazan was getting a, a, an, a, an Oscar award for, uh, for his contributions and there was a leftist critique because Kazan had, uh, uh, because of his, uh, Kazan's, uh, appearing in front of the uh, uh, Un-American Activities Committee of what it was called. And, I, and, and Dan had a very nuanced uh, take explaining, he, he sought to explain why Kazan did what he did. And he said, the guys from Anatolia, he has a, a special issue for him. Authority is the Ottoman oppressor. So he's, 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 he's got this particular view. And I think he, 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 so Dan was kind of trying to be sympathetic towards Kazan, giving Kazan's background. And in that, he, that epitomizes the way that Dan was, was, was independent. He was an, he was an independent leftist thinker. That's why I think he was able to navigate th into the margins and into the mainstream and back again with with no problem because because he, he he had this independent spirit so he was whether he was in the margins or whether he was in the mainstream it was it was dan being independent and that's why i also think in terms of talking to other people who knew him um his his past when he was uh, uh a more quote unquote radical he also was interested in national issues. It just came out more clearly when he became part of the mainstream. And the second point is, I'm glad I mentioned the Greek towns and what I learned about Greek towns from Dan, because this is what I'm getting from this panel, a conversation today, that, that, it's, that you can't understand Greek America without understanding Detroit without understanding Black America, Jewish America, working class America, urban America. That, that's the, the broader context that Dan always kept in his mind. And we will do very well to maintain that broad vision he had. Thank you, Alexander. Um, uh, thank you also, uh, Yorgo, for the, uh, the letter to Dan the letter to Dan, because that got us all emotional, quite frankly, because we're all starting to think about our own personal interface with Dan, and each one has a different perspective. And, and that's what's amazing about him. And I'm sure we can find another few hundred people that had an interface with Dan, whether, whether a large one or a smaller one, that can have all types of memories relating to Dan. Uh, Yorgo, some uh, final comments, uh, words uh, in terms of uh, Dan. Thank you all my co-panelists for the ideas and insights and thank you uh, Lou for organizing uh, this forum. Uh, the first, the first uh, uh, point that I would like to emphasize and what is really, um, I'm really hoping that it will continue. Uh, and that was, I believe also Dan's vision is to create a forum where we have an open dialogue, inclusive dialogue about Greek American issues so that we will learn from each other. Uh, I would like to outline some of the insights that each one of my uh, co-panelists um, expressed. From Nikos, I keep, among other things, the necessity to digitize not only dance archives, but also we need to invest in digitizing Greek American um, archives. Uh, from Herb, uh, I retain the question of what it means to be a radical scholar a radical scholar of ethnicity and diaspora in 2022 and beyond. Uh, from Marvin, I retain the idea of 
politics is culture, culture is politics. Mm-hmm. It matters, the narratives we say about our past, ourselves, our values are political and in this connection, and I, I appreciate uh, Alexander's point, uh, his appreciation of the uh, Dan Georgiakas, Charles Moscow civil exchange, not polemical um, exchange, I would make a point for a more agonistic um, conversation about why the Greek American paradigm, the Greek American narrative of um, struggle and success is not productive to uh, think about Greek America. And I have written extensively about this, but it seems that uh, we need to revisit the issue to really understand what are the implications of this narrative. The implications for also for our alliances with African-Americans, with Asian-Americans. So when we narrate our stories, also indirectly, we speak about other groups and I think we need to dissect these issues. How do we represent ourselves is political and I appreciate um, Marvin's um, point very much. Uh, from Constantinos' uh, uh, interesting uh, account about his place um, in uh, connection to the establishment, I think it was called, and the Modern Greek Studies Association. Uh, I would like to add that uh, it might be that being an outsider to certain institutions could be an advantage. That somehow you could be, uh, speak uh, more freely and in many ways to make critical interventions. Uh, and from Alexander's uh, presentation, I'm keeping the question of what it means uh, to be both a scholar and a cultural activist, a scholar and a public scholar. And in response, finally, the last point of um, uh, uh, Constantinus's closing remarks, indeed, how to make the humanities uh, meaningful to the various Greek American audiences is a very important question that we probe. Thank you very much. Constantine, thank you for that. And, and, th- and thank you all for this um, very interesting discussion that I'd like to continue actually uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the future. I, I hope to get us all back together and just uh, again, discuss, discuss Dan and what transpired with, with this discussion and hopefully keeping some of the things that Dan was interested in alive that many of you mentioned. May his memory uh, be eternal. And, uh, and the way it's eternal is we don't forget. We don't forget Dan. We basically have to, uh, again, discuss the things that he was talking about and see what we have done with the things that he was talking about. So it'll be an interesting discussion, I think, in, in the future. For the audience, uh, join us um, uh, on May the 3rd. It's going to be a different type of discussion. In this case, it's going to be about the metaverse, the metaverse in the 21st century. Uh, we will have uh, people within the industry, the metaverse industry, and we will have it at the uh, at the Three West Club. Thank you all again to the panelists for this, you know, really amazing discussion. That again, uh, I hope to, we hope to continue. And uh, thank you, thank you to the audience for uh, for listening. Thank you, and I hope you you gathered a lot of things that that related to what Dan was about. And uh, we're not going to forget Dan because we're going to be radical. Some of us are radical anyway, but we're going to be even more radical now <laughs> that we've listened to all this conversation. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank you. Thank you.